right, let's get into it today. Uh, we're going to talk all about relationships and marriage and a single season and maybe your post-divorce, wherever you are. Uh, there is life in God's house today. There's healing. Uh, there is something new for you. And, um, you know, in the past we've done whole series around this. This is just going to be a, a once-off. Uh, maybe, you know, in, in months, years to come, I'm sure we'll do that again. But I do want to say, uh, you know, we're no marriage experts per se, but, but I, I will say this. We are 16 years in now. I always want to say 17 or, you know, I, I'm always, yeah, I appreciate that. A little tepid applause. And, you know, especially the people that have been married 60 years, you're like golf clapping us, you know. But I appreciate that. But, but I, I will say this. We are happily married. Yes. She's nodding. All right. Yes. We, we, we really do. We, we've got just a wonderful, incredible, we are so blessed in our marriage. And, of course, that's by God's grace. And so we want to speak from that and some of our own experience and, and really just kind of, to put it really practically, this has worked for us. And um, so when it comes to marriage, uh, come on, it matters. It matters. Uh, when, when your marriage is good, it's almost like everything else is good. But when your marriage is bad, it's almost like everything else is bad. And so we're going to spend just today and, and we're going to speak life and the promises of God over you, but I want to say something bold as we get into it, and, and I promise you it's not just to get your attention because I can see right now that I have at least most of your attention. Maybe a few people on your phone, that's all right. I forgive you, and so does God, I think. I don't know. <laughs> but but I, I don't say this to, for it to be cheap advertisement or to sound like clickbait or whatever. I believe that we've got the solution for, for whatever it is, you know, that, that's been a stress or a struggle or a strain, like there is a solution. And, of course, it's in Christ, and so we want to kind of expound on that a bit. Um, and, and so, like I said, we'll, we'll share from our own marriage a little bit. But let's get into the Bible before we go there. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 and uh, verse 4. Um, what we're going to give you today uh, certainly um, is not a secret, but maybe it kind of feels that way because it's so simple. Uh, sometimes those, those secrets are so simple. Uh, are you there in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4? It's going to be on the screen as well. This is, this is the verse that uh, if you've ever been to a wedding, you've probably heard this. Uh, in fact, I use this when I officiate weddings. Uh, am I retired from officiating weddings? No. Okay, I still have a few coming. You know, you know what I noticed is when we were younger in ministry, everybody's getting married. Now, not as much. You know, we've got younger pastors on staff and everything. People do that. But I also realized something. You know, there's going to come a time where I get so old. It just got dark. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm going to be officiating a whole different kind of event. With a, so, okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to try. I'm going to try and liven it up in here. <laughs> All right, First Corinthians, thirteen four. Um, it's okay. We'll go be with Jesus. Uh, it says this: Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. I want to circle back real quick to verse 5, just that last part of the verse where it says, It does not insist on its own way. Love does not insist on its own way. So here's the premise. It's not my way. It's not her way. There is another way. We want to preach to you uh, for the next few minutes from this subject, meet in the middle. Meet in the middle. If you're taking notes, meet in the middle. Um, how many in the house today, maybe it's everybody, I, I, would, I would think it's everybody, how many like to win? Come on, we, we like to win. There is just something innately in us as humans, we like to win. I like to win at golf um, or more appropriately, I like to imagine what it might be like someday when I perhaps win at golf. It hasn't happened yet. And uh, all my friends that I golf with are like, it's probably not going to happen. But we, we just, we like to win. Um, we, our family has grown. You know, we've, we've got this whole crew now. And when we get together, we play games. And I like the idea that at some point, someday, maybe it'll be Christmas Day. Who knows? I might win at a game. I don't know if it's happened yet, but, but there's, just, there's something in us that likes to win. Uh, let me offer this. There is a type of winning 
that feels like winning but is actually losing. When you're married, uh, the Bible tells us, Genesis tells us, you become one. The two shall become one flesh. So here's something important to know. Marriages in America, when it comes to divorce, and, and you know the divorce rate's somewhere around 50% or, or maybe higher, uh, by and large, when people get divorced, uh, of course there are those times where there's terrible tragedies you know, in marriage, people get tripped up in sin and it's adultery or maybe it's abuse or someone is sinned against. But by and large, the top reason people get divorced when they fill out the certificate and it's all the official documentation and, and the paperwork and the attorneys and all that is irreconcilable differences. We can't continue to be married because we have irreconcilable differences, which is a fancy legal way of saying we can't agree. We, we can't get our lives, our hearts, our our way of dreaming, our, our way of doing life, we can't get it to align. So let's define marriage biblically speaking. And uh, this is not really going to be an amen kind of message. Uh, you can circle back tonight and I'll probably be shouting a bit and you can amen me then. But this will be kind of a quiet message where everybody's kind of up against their chair. And sometimes those are the best messages uh, because we're all, we're, we're, we're maybe quiet um, because we're not preaching, we're processing all right, so, so let's define marriage. Marriage is the process of becoming one. The process of becoming one. It's not getting my way or them getting their way. It's finding another option. It's our way, and even more importantly, it's God's way. It's God's way. So here's something I want you to consider. And, um, you know, the, the moment that you got married, uh, something sacred, something holy Something set apart, you know, something special happens. You make a covenant with each other, you make a covenant with God, and then you, of course, consummate the marriage. And by the way, some of the message might be, you know, maybe PG 13 ish. So just warning if you're still around, you can run out if you want. And, and as that happens, uh, you know, you consummate the marriage. Um, let me also say this our encouragement from the Bible is to wait to have sex until we're married. And if you're not married and having sex, you can stop. And I'm not saying this because I'm an old angry preacher. Um, I, I, I'm not saying this to like hit somebody with the Bible. I'm, I'm not saying this because I'm a boomer. That's what my kids call me when I'm doing something dumb. They're like, you're such a boomer. And so actually I looked it up and check this out. I, I made it by a year. I'm actually a millennial. I'm not technically a boomer. And I try and show my kids that. They don't care. They keep calling me a boomer. But I think my wife is actually technically a boomer. No, I am Gen X, like I, by one year, like 1980. <laughs> I just got in there. By the skin of your teeth. Okay, whatever. We'll Google it later again. But, but I'm, not, I'm not saying that because of any of this. L listen, 1 Corinthians 6 says that sex is not just physical. It's spiritual. It's, it's deeply emotional that in that moment you become one. And, and that you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. That when you said yes to Jesus, you become a temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says don't give yourself to the temple of idols. So in marriage we become one, but then we also enter the process of becoming one. So think about it like, like when you're saved. Uh, the moment you give your life to Christ, you're saved. It's, it's a done deal. The, the, the miracle ha has happened. Uh, you, you've said yes, and you've been washed in the blood, and you are saved. It's done. It's finished. It's, it's, you're saved. But then the Bible phrase, uh, well, the, the Bible phrase for that is, is that you're justified, right? Like, it's just as if you've, you've never sinned, that you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that you're, you're justified when you're saved. But then, as you're saved, the process of, here's another Bible phrase, sanctification kicks in. Where you allow the Holy Spirit to get a hold of your life and transform you into the image of Christ. So not only have you been saved, but you are being saved. And then, of course, when we pass from this life into eternity with the Lord, we will be saved. Where, you know, every tear is wiped away and there's no more anxiety and, and there's no more water bill. And, and there's no more stress or, or struggle. And, and we're in God's presence forever. And so you got saved and you're getting saved. And... and as it is in marriage. It, the Bible actually compares marriage to salvation. So we are one, but we're also becoming one. Because when we get married, uh, here's what's important to understand. We come with different views. And, and we come with different backgrounds. 
and different experiences. And when we get married, we come with different genders. And yeah, we still believe in that around here. We come with different genders. We come with different genders. And, and, and we come with all these differences. And, and we bring that all into the marriage. And yes, it's true that opposites attract. But at the same time, it can be that opposites attack. Amen. Don't amen, you know, with, with too much enthusiasm if your spouse is with you. But most people, you know, will come into marriage with hopes, with dreams, desires. It's a value system. Uh, You know, we come in with how many kids we want to have. We come in with what kind of car we want to drive, what we want to spend money on, where we want to go on vacation. We come in, um, you know, with how we're going to solve conflict. Usually kind of how we saw it done, that's how we're going to do it. Or or we come in with with where we want to eat. But we have to understand something. This is very key. What feels like hopes, dreams, and desires to you are going to feel like expectations to your spouse. So if we're not careful, um, what should be full of life and full of hope and full of what should be enjoyable, watch me, actually becomes transactional. When it feels transactional, here's what we do. We attempt to negotiate. Well, we visited your parents last time, so we're going to visit my parents this time. You blew the budget last time. I'm about to blow the budget this time. I need to practice golf. I suck. Um, We ate where you wanted to eat the last seven times. So we're going to eat. It's always food with us. And, and, And if you hear that without recognizing, you know, what it is, you might say, well, that's just marriage. In fact, that's compromise. So that's not really negative. That's just negotiation. And and you know where else we bring in negotiators? In hostage situations. So without even realizing it, we're ending up feeling like hostages sometimes in our own homes. And negotiating instead of dreaming together about what's next. And the problem with negotiating is that the strongest negotiator always wins. So even as I'm articulating this, there are people in the room that's like, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with some negotiating? You like that because you're the best negotiator. You're winning. But the other spouse, over time, can feel disempowered or maybe unseen or maybe even unloved. And a negotiation really can't happen without a winner and a loser. If I'm winning, then Rochelle is losing. If Rochelle is winning, then I'm losing. But if we know what it is to meet in the miraculous middle, now the marriage wins. And when the marriage wins, we win. And our kids win. And our kids' kids win. And our church wins. And the people we interact with win. And when our marriage is healthy, our whole life can be healthy. And our kids can be healthy. And our ministry can be You see what I'm saying? So, so it's not about me or her, it's about we. And, and if you allow this negotiating spirit to, to grow in your marriage, and, and it's just small stuff. You know, it, it, it's just, I changed the diaper last time, so you're going to change the diaper this time. If you allow it to grow, of course, distance can set in. Uh, you know, because it feels hostile. And, and, and most of us, we want to avoid hostility. And, and then it gets colder, and, and you get busier. And you're seven years in, or you're 15 years in, or you're 25 years in, and, and work is happening, and you're traveling more, and you're hanging out maybe a little bit more with people outside of your marriage. I'm not talking about adultery, but it's just you have this whole other life because sometimes home feels hostile, and, and you're negotiating. And if it isn't resolved, it usually, typically, is going to lead to divorce, or it's going to break down into a long, painful unsuccessful negotiation to dating people in the house today and and we had a packed house at the night of a lot of young people and and you know dating people and, and engaged people um let me humbly submit this and you might get mad at me and, and I might risk sounding like a boomer yet again uh but but I guarantee you all the married people are gonna say yes and amen and they're gonna say preach that preacher um, because because it's, a, it's better to maybe 
have to wait than to be in a marriage that's all wrong. So let me humbly submit this. If you're, if you're dating and, and you're dating someone whose hopes, dreams, desires don't line up with yours, I would seriously consider ending the relationship. Here's why. Right now, you're on your best behavior. Whatever you think is going to get better, not at all. That's the best behavior version. You're not the only one on your best behavior. Guess what? They're on their best behavior as well. All the married people, preach it, preacher. If, if you've got conflict in your best behavior, wait until you're married and your worst is showing up. Now, now let me say this. If you're married, stick it out. Work it out. There's life in God. There's hope. There's promises. I'm not talking about abuse or adultery or, or those types of circumstances. But, but if there are differences, there is one way that there can be a difference made. There is a difference maker. We've got a redeeming God and a healing God and a saving God. And no, it's not always going to be like this. And you're not going to be stuck like this. And, and, and no, you don't have to feel like a hostage in your own home if that's how you, you, you feel in your home right now. But, but, but the reality is if you, if you leave this marriage, you know, and try again because you're saying, I married the wrong one. They're not my soulmate. Well, let me just say this. If you said, I do, then, then soul meet your mate. You're with them, okay? But if you're going to leave that marriage and, and then, you know, wherever you go from there, here's the issue. There you are. Wherever you go from there, you're going to show up there. There you are. You, you might date and marry a new person, but you're the same person. Because in reality, you're going to bring your hopes, your dreams, your desires, and you're going to get upset if they don't support your hopes, your dreams, and your desires. It's actually proven now, statistically, uh, that the more times you know, people are married and divorced, the higher the divorce rate goes in the next relationship, the next marriage. Kind of like people changing churches. The more churches they've been in, the more likely it's going to be that there's going to be more churches that they'll be in. It's just a therapy session for me, just so you know. Why? Because you're looking for something out there when 97% of this has to happen in here. Once you come out of something that was painful or where there was sin, once you come out of something, um, and you're usually not going to come into something with a heart to serve, uh, to, to give your life away to another. You're, you're coming in like, I wasn't served, and now I'm going to need to be served. They didn't hear my dreams, so you better be all ears about my dreams. And you end up projecting expectations from an old relationship and another person. So it's difficult to have a good marriage when you come in with the wrong motives. I want my way this time. I want my dreams this time. I want, I want my, and, and bad can breed bad. And hurt can breed hurt. And disillusionment can, can breed more disillusionment. And when you're hurting, you might not even be able to recognize fully that you're hurting. And so you need to allow time for the Holy Spirit to heal. And I'm going to throw this out there, and again, you might get mad at me, and especially if, you know, you're single and sick of being single. I would give it at least three years. I want to say five years to, to experience healing in the Holy Spirit. Because if, if you feel like you need to rush into something, anytime it's right, you're not going to need to rush. And, and, and so you can find the pace and the power of God. So, so but, 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 but there is another way that... It's not my way, it's not her way, it's our way, and it flows from knowing God's way. And so I want, my wife is actually the one, she makes it all work in our marriage. In our so, marriage? Yeah. Oh. In all of life. Oh, okay. So, so how, do, how, do we make it, how do we make it work? Okay, again, this is the most practical teaching that you'll ever receive. This is something that you can go home and apply immediately. Um, it's so simple, it almost escapes you, really. We always try to, as people, overcomplicate everything. And what we have to share today is just so simple. The Bible is our middle ground. Jesus is our middle ground. It becomes so much easier. It's not his way, my way. It's God's way. And when we do it that way, it just simplifies. You don't have to think as hard. You don't have to strive. You don't have to try as much. Because you're just going to simply say, you know what, I'm just going to do the word of God. I'm going to follow Jesus, and then everything kind of just works itself out. Um, it makes our communication different, 
how we raise our children is different when we use the Bible, how we deal with our in-laws. Do you know that the Bible talks about how you would deal with in-laws and how that all works? In Genesis, there's so much in the Bible that we're not pulling out for ourselves and for our marriage. And we need to be more diligent to be like, what does the word of God say? What is God's heart on this? I'm going to find that out. Because once you get that, it just is a key for you to unlock just so much joy and peace in your marriage. Because then it's not about you and what you're trying to accomplish. It's what God's trying to do. Because we, we have these agendas. A lot of times we're coming into a marriage and there's not unconditional love and there's a lot of agendas happening. But when you do it God's way, it's not about your agenda anymore. It's about what God has to say over your marriage. So it's a beautiful thing. So we all know that we need to go to the Bible as a reference point for our marriage. I mean, we can cognitively, cognitively understand that if you're here on a Sunday morning for sure. But we need to go from knowledge to action. Are we taking the principles of the word of God and are we putting them into action in our marriage specifically? So first we need to know what the Bible says. That's a big important one. And I'm telling you what, it's so much easier nowadays. Like if you're like, okay, what does God say about marriage? You don't have to listen to a sermon or a commentary. You can actually just get scriptures on marriage, write them down in your journal, and look with a pure heart, what is God saying about marriage? Not imposing your own viewpoints on anything, but, like, what does the Bible say? It's so much easier. Back in the day, we had these, like, giant concordances. We're looking stuff up. I remember my the first sermon I preached, I was, like, 17. I had these giant books. I barely knew how to use them, and I'm trying to, like, come up with a sermon. It was so hard. Now it's like you're like, oh, what was that sermon, or what was that scripture? Where'd that come from? You can Google it. It's amazing. So what we need to do as ha people that want to have a good marriage, but we want to grow Maybe we have a good marriage and we want to tune up. We want to make it, you know, God always has more for us. We're always going from glory to glory to glory. So whenever you're feeling kind of like, ah, it's good, it works. No, God has more for us than just it works. God has so much more. And that we can find in the Bible because I'm telling you what, simple Christian disciplines not only just enrich your own life and draw you closer to God, it impacts your marriage and it builds strong families. And that's what we want in this church are strong families that feel empowered by God to do what God's called them to do. So when you're in the church, and I'm talking about Christian disciplines, disciplines kind of like, eh, it's not the greatest word because all of us know in the back of our mind, discipline equals hard work. And sometimes, especially you're rolling in on a Sunday morning, you're like, I just want to relax and, and just get filled up by the Holy Spirit. Like, I'm not trying to hear about disciplines and hard work. Sometimes disciplines don't sound overly spiritual, but they really are. They're completely life-changing. Having a few Christian disciplines that you incorporate in your life that you might not currently have now it's the game changer. It's never the big things. It's always the little things, the little micro adjustments. And we all have some place in our heart, in our marriage, in our relationships where we need to make some micro adjustments. So in the church, sometimes when we hear discipline, we think religion, we think legalism, we think control, and we're like, no, we don't want any of that. We're free in Jesus. But part of the problem of not bracing Christian disciplines is, yeah, you're free in Jesus, but you're not doing as Jesus does. Like, we want to draw closer to him. We want to be more like him, not further like him than him. So Christian disciplines are simply just reading your Bible and doing what the Bible tells you to do and just putting it into practice. There are all sorts of disciplines out there. And in our culture, we really, we honor, we celebrate when people are disciplined. For example, athletes. We admire athletes. They work really, really hard at a young age. They're training. They're lifting weights. They're running. Um, they eat specific diets. They really refrain from certain foods, and they only eat different foods. They've made a lot of sacrifices with their time, with their relationships, what they do. Like, they're not out on a Friday night party. No, because they're an athlete. They have to get up the next morning, and they have to train. We celebrate people that do that. We honor people that do that because we know and we understand that takes a lot of hard work. That takes some discipline and discipline we honor because like wow you know I could have done that but I didn't I was sitting at home watching Netflix but man you did it you made the sacrifices and the choices to get where you become we we honor that we applaud that we think it's great but in the church if a new believer decided man you know what I think I would think I'm gonna stop swearing I think that would be good like I don't know that would be a nice thing and maybe like at work, you're not joking around in the ways that you used to joke around. And all of a sudden, your friends are like, whoa, 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 whoa. 
I think you're taking this Christian thing too serious. Like, you're being like a real freak about this. Like, you need to calm down. And we kind of get pushed back. But all we're trying to do is, like, what would Jesus do? Like, what are Christians doing? What should I be doing? What does the Bible say about this? Um, same with we send our kids off. They're 18. They, we send them off to college. And we celebrate that. We're, they're completely immersed into a culture. They live on campus every day, and they learn at the same place. They eat at the same place. They're sleeping at the same place. They're with all like-minded people for four years doing the same thing every day. And, again, we honor that. We applaud that. We're like, wow, that was really hard work. You paused your life for four years to devote yourself to studying and getting around the same kind of people and doing what you are meant to do. Like, that's so amazing. We go to graduation, we clap for them, we celebrate. But in the church sometimes, we do not celebrate that kind of stuff. When you're a Christian and you start going to church every Sunday, everyone's kind of like, do you have to go every Sunday? I mean, that's a lot. Like, every Sunday, I mean, it's an hour and a half. Like, but people are, oh, wow, every Sunday, prayer, an hour of prayer? Oh, man, you should skip that. Like, God knows your heart. Like, you don't have to actually go to prayer a group, like, getting around all like-minded people that are all trying to pursue and love God, your family then is thinking, like, you must be in a cult. Like, this is way too much. Like, you are just immersing yourself in way too much of this Christian thing. But as believers, we need to really start celebrating each other and ourselves and be proud of ourselves when we're like, man, I had that habit, but I kicked it. Or I was doing this, I'm not doing that anymore. I was going that route, and that I'm not doing anymore. And be proud of that. Because that means God's doing something in your life, and we need to celebrate each other and celebrate ourselves and be like, man, I talked to someone in the foyer, and she was just saying, like, two years ago, man, I was a different person two years ago. God has done something in my life. That is for reason to celebrate. That's amazing. So we want to celebrate that because Christian disciplines truly are the key, not only to draw closer to God, but to make marriage work because that is truly middle ground. And it's such a simple idea, but when we as individuals can become more disciplined in our practices, we're talking like your marriage is changing, your parenting is changing, you're changing generations, you're setting yourself up for success. So what we know is Christian disciplines are not legalism, it's not control, it's not spiritual manipulation, because Christian disciplines, we're reading the word of God, we don't fall into that trap, because we know the word, we can't be tricked in that way. So I'm just going to go over just like a couple Christian disciplines that I feel like there's so much more than what I'm covering, but if you just implemented a couple of these, man, it'd be a game changer for your marriage, it would really take you to another level. Number one, I've kind of already talked about it a bit, reading your Bible, because that's where you're going to learn. I remember one time we were in group, and we were talking, and we are answering questions and talking about the sermon, and someone raised their hand. She's like, hey, how do you guys know you guys are talking about sin? What is sin? Like, how do you know what is sin? Like, what are sins? Can you give me some examples? And it was so cool, and I'm like, yes. So we pulled out the Bible, like, and showed her the list of, like, the different sins that there would be in the Bible. And it was just, like, a mind blow for her. She's like, oh, okay, so, like, I'm not really supposed to do these things. We're like, no, like, God wants to set you free from that. Such a powerful thing, but oftentimes we are not opening up our Bible just to get those little nuggets for our marriage and for our lives. So read the word. It's a great Christian discipline. It's easy. Prayer. In 1 Thessalonians, it says, pray without ceasing. Prayer is so powerful. I'm telling you what, when I come to prayer, you come in sometimes with, like, your prayer list or what you're trying to do. And when you just spend time in the presence of God, it's so funny. He will just start downloading stuff to you. You're, you think about an old friend, like, man, I need to ask her for forgiveness, or I need to have that hard conversation, and God starts to do something in your heart. Prayer is powerful, and I'm not even when you're praying your specific list of like, okay, this is what my marriage needs. No, which is when you're spending time in worship in the presence of God, those things just start to fall off of you. Church. Jesus made a habit of going to church, and so we need to do what Jesus did. If he needed church, we need church. So it says in Luke 4, 16, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue as was his custom. Church is so important. It's where you get filled up. It's when you get lifted up. You're in community. Iron sharpens iron. You don't feel alone. We're all on this journey. And most of us on our our, dealing with very similar things. And it's really nice to have a friend. And you're like, you too. You are also going through this. There's something powerful about being together. Forgiveness. 
Forgiveness is a great discipline to have in your life. Forgiveness is really what uh, separates Christians from people in the world. And if, any of them, if anyone's been married for like five minutes, you know forgiveness is really high on the list. And the longer you've been married, the more you have to forgive. Like there is just a lot of things that we do to each other, that we say to each other, that we're thinking that we have to ask forgiveness for. Because if you go long periods of time and no one is like, asking for forgiveness or apologizing, someone's probably being very silent and suffering in silence, and we don't want that. We want to be really quick to forgive and to ask for forgiveness. Alcohol. Alcohol is a big one for marriages. When we were doing some research, it's in the top five reasons why someone would get divorced. Substance abuse kills marriages, and so you say to yourself, okay, like, what does the Bible say about alcohol? Like, where do we stand on that? It's really easy. In Ephesians 5.18, it says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. So again, it's not legalistic. Jesus drank wine. That's not what I'm saying. But what it is saying is don't be drunk. I'm telling you, we all know that being drunk is not a good idea. You come in, you're sloshing around, you're drunk, and you're just saying whatever you want to say. That's probably not going to bode well for a good marriage. Can anyone agree with that? So the Bible is so good. Common sense. Common sense things. They're like, hey, what's our stance on this? Or where, what, what should we do in our marriage? It's really easy. It's in the Bible. And it's going to help you have success and joy and peace. We all want a little bit more peace. We don't want to keep stirring it up and messing it up. Pornography. We get this question a lot. Can we look at pornography? Is pornography okay in marriage? It's not. And the reason why we know that is because Matthew 5 says it's better to pluck out your eyes than to look at a woman with lust. And again, that's really dramatic verbiage to pluck out your eyes. But in our context, it's really simple. Maybe you're not allowed to have a computer. Maybe you can't handle a smartphone. Those kind of simple things because your marriage is more important than making sure you have the latest iPhone. There's things that you need to do in your marriage. And again, like, go ahead and get into the Bible and look it up so much more than what I just said. But then it makes it easy. It's like, oh, okay, so that is not a Christian discipline. That's something that we avoid as Christians. Yes, it's really easy. So not only are we avoiding things, but we're also, what does the Bible say we should do? A really good one is the fruit of the Spirit. Having the fruit of the Spirit is so important. It's very simple, and it's a really good reminder, like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. Sometimes when we come home after a long day and we've been at work or we've been dealing with the kids, our fruit of the Spirit kind of just, like, goes down. What we do is we're, like, we're comfortable with each other. He's seen me at my worst. So it's just kind of like you're, like, eh, you just become very lax. You're just, like, whatever. And you end up giving your spouse the worst version of you. Give your spouse spouse like the Holy Spirit inspired beautiful version of yourself don't give them the worst version of yourself obviously they have grace and they know you but we just kind of let our guard down so much we're just really catty and petty and we're nagging and it's not like it's like this outright sin but there's just kind of just this negativity that we have in our home that is very unpleasant no one enjoys don't do it have the fruit of the Spirit Give that to your spouse. Give that to yourselves. So, again, this is just a handful of some Christian disciplines. There's so much more. And you know in your own marriage those little spots that need to be tweaked or need to be fixed. And you can go in the Word and find those things. Because once we start obeying the basics, sometimes we're asking for these great miracles from God. Sometimes we're asking for a prophetic word. Sometimes we're saying, God, like, what is our calling as a couple? And I'm telling you, if you're not doing the basic of what the Bible says for your marriage, then it's going to be really hard to hear the Holy Spirit on specifics. So I'd always encourage you, always do the Christian disciplines. Always do the basics. Do what the Bible says. And then you're opening up your marriage where you can then ask for really specific things that God wants for you and your spouse. You can be led by the Holy Spirit, and you're just going from glory to glory, and it is good. I think one thing that we do in marriage in, uh, is we think too small. So anytime there's conflict or negativity or difficulty in our life, we assume it's our marriage. So if you're having money problems, people won't say, oh, I'm having money problems. Can you pray for me? They'll be like, can you pray for me? Our marriage is struggling. It's because your marriage is under stress because of the marriage problem. But it's not a marriage problem. It's a money problem or raising kids, whatever the problem might be, a lot of times your first person that you're attacking, you're looking to to put fault, we all want to put fault to something, whether it's the devil, whether it's our spouse, very rarely to ourselves, but we're always trying to assign fault. 
And so when you have struggles that are just sometimes just circumstantial or just things that come up in life, the first person we attack is our spouse. So instead of coming together as one to solve the problem, conquer the problem, take care of the problem, we, we're coming at each other. So we're thinking too small. We're really thinking about the, the very specific problems. I'll give some examples. So let's say there's a lack of um, physical intimacy in your marriage, and so you're frustrated. So a quick fix, you're like, okay, well, let's go on vacation. Uh, maybe that'll help. And it's like, yeah, that probably would. Like, I mean, we call it a sexcation. Like, there's certain places you go. Like, you're going to Mexico. You're going to Hawaii. It's TMI, you know. but okay. Yeah. You know. So that's that. But, that, you know, that solves the problem for, what, two weeks? Maybe that's too small of a question or too small of a focus. Okay, we're having intimacy problems. Maybe the bigger focus is, is, you know, what does the Bible say about sex? What does the Bible say about intimacy? What do I believe? Do I have hurt from past things? Do I have misperceptions? Am I not seeing it the way God sees it? Sometimes we need to step back and we need to ask a bigger question. Instead of trying to fix these tiny little things, get to the deeper root of the problem. There's overarching themes that will sometimes happen where you're like, okay, you're thinking it's this, this one little thing. But maybe if you step back a little bit and you looked at a bigger picture, maybe you could see some habits, some things that you were doing, maybe some misconceptions that you had that you need to get set free and healed from to address that smaller issue. Maybe it's money problems. Money, I mean, it took us, I remember when we were first married, we did Dave Ramsey. We had so much anxiety doing Dave Ramsey. I thought I was going to have a nervous breakdown. It's like, put the money in this envelope, that, that envelope. I was like, I don't have any money to put no in the envelopes. <laughs> We were so stressed. We were young. We were in ministry. It was, yeah, so uh, that was always a hard topic for us to have because we wanted to keep, you know, marriage light and happy and fun. I, I, put, I put our gas money in a Dave Ramsey gas money envelope. So, you know, it's like get cash and put it in envelopes. And I fell out of my back pocket. And guess what? My mess was somebody else's miracle. Yep. You, they, they, were, they, were pray, they were probably praying in the Holy Ghost, walking along, Lord, I need yes. gas. And then they look down, there's this envelope that says gas on it, and they pick it up. <laughs> That's my Dave Ramsey experience. Yeah, yeah. So a quick solution is don't talk about it. Get separate bank accounts. Like, you spend your money, I spend my money. That would be a quick problem solver, but not a solution for long term. A long term solution is, what does the Bible say about money? Yep. Do I have a love of money? Because love of money is the root of all evil. Do I pursue money? Do I have unhealthy relationship with money? Do I tie? Do I feel like there's a blessing over our home? Is God covering us? Is our finances blessed by the Lord? Just the bigger questions than like, oh, like our next paycheck, like, uh, you know, trying to fight over who gets to spend the money first after bills are paid. But instead of doing that, really thinking like, God, what do you have to say about this? What does the word of God have to say about this? Taking a step back and saying, how can we change this long term that we can experience God's blessing and glory in our life? Parenting. Parenting is a big one. Parenting is very, very hard. We have different personalities. We have different viewpoints. We have just different ways that we interact with our children. Um, it's just, it's one of those things that it comes up. And because kids are just innately sinful, they will use it against you. And so as they get older, like, they'll pit each other. Like, you get pitted against each other. And one's over there crying, like, Dad said. It, you know, it, there's just a lot of elements. There's a lot going on there with parenting. So a quick fix would be, and what I've seen a lot, is moms just kind of just say, hey, I'm going to be the main parental role. And dads, you can kind of step to the side. And you hear this phrase a lot. You see it in television, and, and, and you hear it in the church. You know, um, mom saying to the kid, don't tell your dad. Don't tell your dad. And so, again, like, the problem is so much bigger than what is actually happening. The problem is, you know, if you took a step back, you know, what do you believe about family? What does the word of God say about family? What does the word of God say about a husband's role as the head of the household over the family? Would that mean that we're keeping secrets from each other about parenting? Does that mean we're just doing it on our own? Like, what does the word of God have to say? And stepping back and saying, hey, are we raising our kids biblically? Are we on the same page of what God would have for us? And so, again, we focus on these little things, these day-to-day -day things. We'll nitpick at that. Because it's easier to nitpick at these little things than have to step back and be like, hey, you might need to change everything here. We need to step back and really, is God, are we really giving him place in our family and in our parenting? And that can be a lot harder. But I'm telling you what, 
it is so much easier because the Bible is the great equalizer. And when you are doing what God would have for you, it just puts you on the same page. You are able to meet in the middle like you've never been able to before. Because then it doesn't become about a personality or an opinion. It becomes about the word of God. And so that really helps. So when we meet in the middle, it's no easy task. It's a lot of hard work. It takes discipline. It takes breaking old habits. It takes having hard conversations. I'm hoping that today would inspire when you get in the car to have a conversation you might not have been able to have prior to this morning. It's really important to be able to do that. Whenever you want to develop a new Christian discipline or a new habit or something different in your life, you want to break off some old patterns, it can feel very awkward. You can almost feel like an imposter of yourself because you're like, I know I'm not like this and kind of everyone around me knows I'm not like this. So I feel uncomfortable trying to do this new persona or trying to live Christ-like. Uh, when I was a freshman, we had just moved from Everett, Washington to Spokane, Washington. I had been homeschooled for three years. We just moved into a new town. So I'm at a new church. I'm at a new school. And I don't know anyone. I have no friends. I feel very awkward and uncomfortable because I've been homeschooled for so long that, like, I don't even know, like, how to, like, have a conversation with a new person. I'm just, like, struggling. So I'm at school, and I realize, like, oh, my gosh, I love the kids that wear the Letterman's jackets. Like, that's so cool. I'm going to ask my mom and dad to buy me a Letterman's jacket because I just thought they looked so cool. They looked so school-like. Like, it seemed like something, like, on, in Greece, like, where they're wearing, like, Letterman's jackets. I'm like, this is amazing. So I'm telling my mom and dad, like, I want a Letterman's jacket. And my mom's like, Rochelle, you have to letter in something to get a Letterman's jacket. And I'm like, what? So I'm like, okay, okay. Um, so I'm deciding I'm going to pick out my sport, you know. I'm a freshman, never played sports before, like, at all. So I decided, okay, I'm going to play tennis. How I came to that conclusion is the tennis skirts were cute. It seemed feminine. I could wear a bow in my hair. Like, I just thought, okay, I can do this. I can play tennis. So I get on the tennis team, and honestly, it was, I was a nightmare. I can just, I probably had my jewelry on. I probably had, like, fake press-on nails. I mean, I was just kind of, like, floating around on the tennis court thinking, like, oh, this is so much fun. Um, I was such a bad tennis player that my tennis coach, like, wouldn't give me direct eye contact. <laughs> you know you're bad at something when someone, like, won't look at you, and they're the person who's supposed to be teaching and training you, and they won't even, like, acknowledge your existence because they're like, you're so bad. Like, I can't physically t stomach it right now. So, but I didn't care. I was just bold and young, and I just thought, I need to make friends. I kind of need to put myself out there. Like, I'm going to play tennis. I don't care. I'm going to get that little men's jacket. And so I played, and I practiced. I'm telling you what, my junior and senior year, I blew everyone out of the water. Like, I was in top four. I didn't have to play doubles anymore. I was singles because I was so mean and aggressive. No one wanted to play doubles with me anyway. Um... But long story short, I actually never got the Letterman's jacket. Then I was over it. I was like, eh, I don't need a Letterman's jacket. That's for nerds. That's, I, then I came full circle. But all that to say is when you put yourself out there, and this is a funny example, but it's awkward. It's uncomfortable. You just think, what am I doing here? Like, I feel so weird, especially when you're having to do it together. Like, do we go to prayer together? Like, are we going to, like, lift our hands and worship together? Are we going to read a parenting book together? Like, it feels so intense and overwhelming. But I'd encourage you, like, press through that awkwardness. Really be brave. I think it's very brave when people do things that are hard for them to do. Um, it's very honorable. So I would press through those feelings of awkwardness. And the more you do it, the easier it gets. And then as the Holy Spirit is working through your life, you're not an imposter anymore. You're really filled up. Your strength in God is working through you. Think such great thoughts about God that you believe that he could do great things in you, right? So do that. And the last thing before I end, I didn't add this last time, but I just want to say, um, in our culture, in the church, it's so easy to be able to justify anything away. So when we read the word of God, we read it, we know that it's true, but we somehow are able to justify why that does not apply to us. And so I'm just going to use one example because it actually comes up a lot. Um, when I meet, I meet with a lot of women for coffee, and I've done women's ministry for a long time. So just conversations come up, people ask me questions. I love it. The more awkward you feel about the conversation you're, or the question you're about to ask, the more I probably love it. And the more I've probably answered it like 20 times. We all have the same questions. So I'll sit down, and a woman will be like, okay, I know the word of God says, like, you know, you're supposed to be intimate with your husband. But I don't want to be because A, B, C, and D. Maybe it's past things. Maybe it's her. Maybe, there's just lots of different reasons. 
and not in the mood, whatever. And so they'll sit across from me and be like, our marriage is really struggling. And, and I'll ask them, okay, what about your intimacy? Well, no, but, and then they'll give me like all the reasons why that scripture doesn't apply to them. This is just one example. Um, and I, I'm thinking, I'm sitting there always across the table and this has happened, I'm talking like many, many, many times. This is a common conversation. I'm thinking to myself, you're struggling in that area. Your marriage is struggling. You read the word of God. You see it. You're asking me my opinion, and I give it to you, and then you still are able to justify that away. So to me, I'm like, man, what is it about that? Because do you want to have a good marriage? Do you want to do what the word of God says, or you just want to justify your own behavior? And we get trapped in that loop. We'll admit we have a problem, but then we justify all the reasons why we cannot get out of that problem and why we need to stay in it. So I'd encourage you as believers, as Christians, that don't justify away sin or apathy, but really just say, man, I need help. I need healing. God, help me. If my heart's not there and I feel like that feels like a million miles away from me able to get from point A to point B, that's okay. That's a perfect place to be because that's when God can come in and bring healing and um, fulfillment in that. Yeah, so good. I love that so much. And it's so true what you said, that it can feel awkward. You feel like an imposter of yourself. And you know, we've all heard the phrase, fake it until you make it. I think, I think sometimes it's, you know, it's like faith it until you make it. Just, just have faith. Just do it. Just show up and do it. And, and for our marriage, and we're going to close here, um, we, have, we have built our lives, our family, our marriage on, like you shared, um, the word of God, the scripture, God's promises and we've built our life in God's presence. God's promises and God's presence. I, I want to read just a, a few verses of scripture. You don't have to uh, turn there. But this truly is the secret. Um, Hebrews 4.16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. That we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Psalm 91 verse 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Here it is. It's drawing close to God. Drawing close to God. You know, in the 80s and 90s, uh, every, every single sermon you heard on marriage, every seminar you went to on marriage, everybody that they brought in on marriage, they all had the same illustration. And it was a triangle. And, you know, you're on one corner of the triangle on the bottom. You know, your spouse is on the other corner of the triangle on the bottom. And then God's at the top of the triangle. And that as you grew close to God, you would automatically grow close to each other. And, and I think that the reason everybody used that illustration for 30 years is because it's so accurate. When, when you draw close to God, uh, for the forgiveness that you need just gets on your life. When, when you draw close to God, the strength that you need, the wisdom that you need, it just gets on your life. When, when, when you're in God's presence, you've got favor on your life. You've got the blessing of God on, on your mind and on your soul and on your spirit. And everything is different. And I wrote it down like this. If you're both standing on holy ground, you're going to be standing on the same ground. If you're both standing on holy ground, you're going to be standing on the same ground. Middle, the middle ground is miraculous ground. Well, yeah, but my spouse doesn't want to serve God, and they won't come to church, and they won't have anything to do with God, you know, other than maybe saying the blessing at Christmas time. Um, I, I see you. I know that you're here today. I experienced that dynamic in, in my own family with my parents. The Bible's clear, and, and when that's happened, and obviously it's hard, the Bible is clear. Your marriage is your ministry. So here's what you do. You get in the presence of God and you wait for them to join you there. You get in the presence of God and you intercede for them there. You get in the presence of God and you bring up their name before the Lord and you have a biblical right to have a confidence and a hope that they are going to be saved, that they're going to be set free of their past, that they're going to serve the Lord. And I also experienced that in my family as well. And, and I would say if you're single, you know, or if you're divorced, here's what you do. You get in the presence of God and you wait for the right one to join you there. You get in God's presence and, and if you have to leave God's presence to go get them and try and drag them back in, they ain't the one for you. If you got to leave God's presence and you got to go out to the club on a Saturday, they're not the one for you. So here's what you do. You get in God's presence and you worship and you pray and you serve the Lord and, and, and every once in a while, just look around and see who's there, and then you worship, and when, and when the right one is there in the presence of God with you, there you are. 
But I'm telling you, a million problems, a million problems will just disappear. You know, I mentioned that, that beautiful verse, the, the mountains melt like wax. There will be a million problems that melt like wax when you simply say, we're going to live our life in God's presence. I'm going to put it all on God's promises. That's all we've done. We don't have any secret sauce. We have an incredible marriage. I wait for it or not every time, just for, you know, for affirmation. It, it's, it's not a silver bullet. It's not a new book. It's a hard, it's, of course it's hard work. Of course it's getting up every day. Of course it's becoming one. That's, that's sometimes a crazy process. But I promise you, as much as I know anything, if you'll, if you'll stake it on God's promises, because, you know, you know, back in the day um, when we would have a debate with somebody and we could, we could, no, I'm right, no, I'm right. We, we could have that debate for months, years sometimes, until we found like a professor or something that would, would finally be an authority. Now we just have instant information of the entire universe in our pocket, and we'd be like, you're wrong, I'm right. Debate solved, right? We do that with our phones. That's what the scripture does in your marriage. You don't have to, oh, what should we be doing? Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. Oh, what are we going to do? Let's go to the promises of God. What has God spoken? Let's speak that. Let's live that. Let's get in the presence of God where our hearts are soft to receive. Come on, let's stand up together. I want to pray.